Thanks, everybody. Thanks for joining. It's good to see all of you. How's the conference going so far? Excellent. Good. I love it. Is it who got to check out Dr. Kabukian in the last one? Yay! Um, I first, I've, I've first saw, saw her at uh, the Singularity University conference, and I told everybody about this panel because I thought it was fantastic. It was, it was very uncomfortable. There were a few the very different um, points of view, and uh, and uh, it has me think. You know, anytime you put a you put a panel together, you really want people that don't agree. Just so much more. It's so much more exciting. It's true. You want conflict. You want different opinions. You want diversity of opinions, right? Good. Thanks, everyone, for joining today. Um, now, I truly live for the day when we no longer have to have a women in tech panel, when this just isn't a thing, and when I'm not looking out at a sea of fantastic male faces. Um, but uh, we need to keep having these conversations to, in order to make that happen. Um, so, you know, currently there's only 5% of tech CEOs that are women. And 21.6% of um, uh, people on boards in the um, Financial Post 500 Canadian companies are women. So there's a lot of work left to do. And um, today I want to talk about how, you know, how we can do that, how all of you can make a difference. Um, so there are three themes that I want to talk about today with our, with our panel. Um, getting more women into technology leadership roles. Um, systemic challenges and changes. And sponsorship and advocacy. So I'm going to first uh, introduce the panel. Um, and then we'll get right into it. So um, we have Michelle Gorman. Michelle and I used to work in consulting together. We recently connected at, at a Boardlist event. Um, so Michelle is a women's leadership advocate, founder of Lead With Women, and most recently hit reset on her 25-year career, um, and is a co-founder of Kidictive, which is a startup with a mission to help kids embrace both the power of technology and the joy that can be only found in playing, creating, imagining, experimenting, and connecting with others. Welcome, Michelle. David Sear. David Sear is a colleague of mine um, from RBC. Um, he's a senior vice president in technology and operations. He leads a team responsible for the oversight of all architecture, application development, systems management, and leadership of teams in Canada and the US for a broad set of products and services in payments, commercial, branch, and check image processing. David's also the co-lead of our Women in Technology Employee Resource Group. Welcome, David. Dr. Ann Kavukian is a, recognizes one of the world's leading privacy experts, which she just demonstrated in, the, in the, her uh, presentation. She's presently the distinguished expert in resident leading the Privacy by Design Center of Excellence at Ryerson. Um, she served three terms as the Information and Privacy Commissioner of Ontario, and just this Tuesday received the Meritorious Service Medal um, from our Governor General, Julie Payette. Welcome. Carla Binger also joins us. She's a seasons professional, um, currently with RBC um, in our uh, procurement, uh, procur excuse me, procurement group. Um, she's also worked at IBM, Soft Choice, Telus, CAA, and many more. Welcome, Carla. And uh, our last panelist, Olga Sukowski. Um, she's a consultant and instrumentation and electrical um, designer at OS Design Group. Thank you for joining us today. It was last minute, and so you kindly, kindly joined us. Thank you. All right. So let's get rolling. OK. So as many of us have seen, the best leaders in technology aren't necessarily the best developers. The best leaders are excellent problem solvers, creating and communicating a vision that meets the needs of the clients, users, and customers. They remove roadblocks and barriers so their teams can build solutions. So I want to start with um, a question from Michelle. So as part of your consulting practice lead with women, you advise leaders on increasing diversity in their organizations and changing their perspectives on the best candidates. Can you share with us some of your successful strategies to date? Absolutely, and I think that that is one of the things that I've come across most working in tech. When we've been trying to bring more women as developers into our organization as well as into leadership roles, and I've had this wonderful question asked, well, you know, we really want to hire the best candidate and we don't have enough women, and they're not the best candidate when we interview them. And so the reality of that is that perhaps the dynamic in which we're defining best is not the right criteria. We're not having the right thinking in the room. We're not looking at who the customers are that we're developing for. So the best candidate is the one that meets that criteria. 
that has the representation, the thought process, the reflection of our customers, and the reflection of the employee base that we want to create. So when you change that definition, then it actually changes who the best candidate is. Um, I have um, a very wonderful uh, colleague that I used to work with who, through the process that our uh, CTO had implemented before I joined, uh, created a tech test. And this was like three hour technical test that individuals had to come into a room that was a fishbowl that people could walk by while they sat on a computer and had to create, had to solve this kind of tricky technical problem. Now this woman, uh, Ramon, uh, Renata Vaccaro, amazing technical director, um, literally said that she almost threw up <laughs> before she even got into the test. And she technically failed the test, but because she had come in through a recommendation from someone else, they had the interview. And on a whim, they decided to hire her. Uh, Renata was definitely the most coveted technical leader because she focused on problem solving. She removed roadblocks. She supported her team. Um, she, she's a, an amazing uh, a leader in technology. Unfortunately, um, the environment that we we're working in didn't support that, and she subsequently left, um, and, and as, as actually I did. Um, but the reality was is that the criteria that was set out for the technical director was not the right criteria, and they realized only after she left that they had to really revamp the way they were viewing things. So it was, um, it's, it's something to constantly think about what is the best candidate and what they look like, and it may not be what we have traditionally looked at. Great. Thank you, Michelle. David, can I pass it along to you? Sure. Um, sure. Can you share some of the ways that both you and RBC are advancing gender equity in, in leadership roles? I know that you've got some great examples. Yeah, sure. Um, I, I want to pick up on your point. Um, it's about looking at the job in a much broader spectrum. And when you get to the senior levels, it's not about you're the best program. I haven't programmed in 30 years. It's about are you the best general manager? Are you the best leader or whatever? But regardless. Um, you know, it, with our teams and, and within RBC, we look at uh, mentoring, we look at sponsorship, and really, um, and book clubs, for example. I mean, book club sounds kind of corny, but I run a book club for women. Um, why would a middle-aged white guy run a book club for women? But it is hugely oversubscribed. We get about uh, 50 to 100 women a year. Um, I pick from a series of leadership books and ask them to read it, and we get together over wine and cocktails, and just like a regular book club. Um, seems kind of corny, but the reality is uh, it's a great discussion. So that's, that's one way. It doesn't cost you anything other than maybe a little bit of wine um, and maybe you know, 50, 60 copies of a book. If you want to know some of the books we've read, I'm happy to provide that later. Um, that's one. Uh, Widow, you, you mentioned already, I co-chair it with a long-term peer of mine, Jennifer Stott, and we hold uh, an annual Women's Day conference that's uh, widely attended, five, six hundred uh, managers, executives, consultants within the organization. And we bring in speakers and uh, have you know, offshooting seminars for them as well. The simple stuff is uh, really stepping back and, and thinking about diversity of team. And um, you, you really have to think about the breadth of the team. And the teams that I think about that have been the best teams I've led um, are the ones that have diversity of thought. And you don't get diversity of thought with a bunch of guys sitting around a table. Um, you get diversity of thought with a bunch of leaders sitting around the table, different education backgrounds, different experiences, different ages, and yes, different genders. So those are some of the ways now that we're trying to attack the problem. Thank you, Dave. Dr. Kabukian, you've had experience with both government and academia. Could you share some things that you've seen um, that have been successful in both of those areas? In terms of the women? Or just, you know, uh, I started out many years ago as an undergrad at Glendon College, and it was really interesting. The women's movement was just starting, and uh, I started a women's group. And it was all about getting women involved, but I wanted men as well. I wanted it to embrace everyone. Uh, I, I was a psychology undergrad. And the whole point of it was engage everyone. To me, Feminism is all about equality. 
equality of the choices you make, both in terms of education and opportunities, employment opportunities, and things of that nature. And this wonderful young man is bringing me cookies to eat. Um, <laughs> you are so kind, and I will not eat them right now, <laughs> but I will eat them soon. Thank you so much, sir. I'm hypoglycemic, and that's why I needed to eat something. He's very kind. People are so kind. To me, it's all about, when we talk about inclusion and diversity, th these are such obvious things to me. Um, I happen to be Armenian. I was born in Egypt. I'm obviously female. And getting people to accept, I remember when we first moved here, I was four years old, and I, I didn't speak English at the time. Um, I spoke Egyptian, Armenian, and Turkish. And that didn't go well in the schools. So, <laughs> so I was, um, my mother told me that I went silent for six months, didn't speak a word, which believe me, if you know me, that's not me. Uh, and then at the end of six months, I started speaking English and everything was fine. When you're four, I guess you can pick it up that quickly. But what the only thing I remember from those years was how unacceptable it was to be different. And that's the only thing that drives me crazy. We used to, a stupid s story, but my, my mother used to make us wonderful feta cheese and olive sandwiches, um, which were fabulous. But at that time, nobody knew that black olives were black olives, and in the school, in the lunchroom, they would say, oh my god, she's eating ants. Ooh, get her out of here. And I would be crying all the time, and my brother Rafi would put his arm around me and comfort me. But it's just being different, and my clothes were different. So the, the message I try to tell people is value that which is different and, and learn from it. So as a woman, I've always tried to rise as much as I could uh, in, in whatever field. But to this day, I still attend certain meetings. I'm still the only woman in the room. It, it strikes me as unbelievable. It's gotten much better. But we still have so much work to do. But I don't want to say this as an anti-male thing. This, the only thing that bothers me these days with the direction that things are taking is it's somehow uh, anti-men, which I think is such a mistake. We have institutions that have cultivated this for whatever reasons for years. It's not that the men in the room are the problem. We have to address the broader issues. In terms of privacy, the work that I do, that's what I also try to get across, that privacy is not an obstacle to security or to data analytics or functionality. You have to weave it in. You have to do both. Learn how to do both and gain much more. You gain a much better competitive advantage if you weave in privacy and security and data analytics. To me, the and equation is what it's all about, and the same applies to men and women. We need both. Thank you. So for my next question, it's really around some of the changes um, and challenges that we see. Um, so, you know, and we've seen a lot in our, you know, recent headlines suggesting um, uh, that women can fa face some of those challenges, whether it's access to stretch opportunities, networks, resources. Um, and so my question is, you know, in your view, what are some of these systemic challenges and what roles can advocates, mentors, sponsors, and managers play in addressing these challenges? So I want to start with Olga. So Olga's had a you know um, a long career um, in engineering, uh, with experience in oil and gas and mining. Um, so I'm sure you're you know <laughs> no shortage of um, uh, male-dominated industries. Um, could you share what what changes you think are needed to ensure the advancement of women? And I know we spoke earlier about um, earlier in the pipeline about education. Um, could you share some of the, some of your thoughts? Yes, certainly. Um, yes, I've been in the field of uh, engineering for the past 40 years. Actually pioneered in that area as a woman amongst men. Yep. I came from uh, a country where that was not important, whether I was a woman or a man to do my job. And here it became important. However, I have no complaints being mistreated, underpaid, not given the job, uh, I don't have that experience. I looked at men most of the time, all men, one woman in the office, I looked at them as the other person I work with. Mm -hmm. And I was getting the same in response from them. 
we are here to do this job, which was very important. We have to build a plant. That plant has to be safe, has to be operational. When we leave this project, we don't want things to explode. <laughs> That's yes, what yes, we <laughs> wanted. That's what we wanted to do, not to compare who is who. Mm -hmm. With the time, I'm talking about the time where engineering was important. Still is important. However, it's sec taking second place now, having all this uh, IT development, mm -hmm. artificial intel intelligence coming in, and all that. So it's kind of taking second place and kind of I don't see marrying the two. I don't see that us who programmed starting 1980, that remotely we can watch what's going on with the plant and possibility to control, we wouldn't because we didn't feel it would be safe. Till this day, you can control plant from anywhere in the world to anywhere in the world mm -hmm. in their own specific way of doing it, which is not very much connected with IT we are discussing here today. And it's very important, the two, to be brought closer together, understanding between the two. Mm -hmm. Now, speaking, speaking of women coming into the field of technology in general, engineering, IT, um, I think it's quite a bit of progress from the time that I started in till this day. A lot more women get on board and a lot more women are being successful in the field. Mm -hmm. However, getting to the managerial position, becoming a leader, I think it takes additional training, additional skills. We get too involved into the code we need to write or into the putting together all the elements in the drawing so that's operational, that's where we spend the time and we go home, we still think about it. Mm -hmm. We don't think about how, I, how I'm gonna become a leader here. <laughs> so additional training to the people in general, I agree with the doctor here, men and women, mm -hmm. regardless. I don't, know, I don't want to separate being so long in the industry, <laughs> I don't want to say us women are less or more. Equally, we try to bring bread on the table for our families and be useful for this society and produce something that's safe for the public. <laughs> Basically, that's what technology does. So in my opinion, or my contribution to this discussion is additional training about leadership. Great, thank you. Carla. You worked at many organizations, big, small. Um, can you share where you've seen this done well? So the places that I've seen it done well, um, the places I've seen it done well is an environment that is very open to collaboration. In the, in the extent, it could be from a day-to-day -day process, a situation, or a project of people who are willing to come together and have the discussions that are difficult, that are challenging, um, but people who are willing to listen. And sometimes it's going on that difficult path, having that challenging discussion, having the back and forth, and forth opposing ideas, but working together and understanding our end goal is this pretend potential deliverable. So it's happened in many different organizations I've been with in different situations, but that collaborative mindset has been the best environment that to see people of all diversities thrive. All right, thank you. Um, David, can you talk a little bit about how you've worked with or, or how you talk to other men about these issues? Uh, I'm giving you all the easy questions, right? Yeah, exactly, thanks a lot. <laughs> um, I'll give you an example on my own team. It's, uh, I think I have 12 or 13 directs. Uh, it's roughly half and half. Um, and I would say age-wise, it's roughly half and half. There's uh, some of us who are you know, possibly near the end of our career and some, some who are starting out. And the age and gender mix uh, is throughout that. Um, when there's a hiring decision, uh, one of the things that we uh, always uh, discuss, debate, whatever, as a team is, did you look at gender diversity? Um, did you look at um, you know uh, people with disabilities? Did you look at other potentials? Um, clearly, in IT, we can hire for uh, 
uh, disabilities, and we've done it quite successfully at RBC. Um, so there's opportunity to do that. Um, the other thing I always push them for is, did you reach into the organization rather than passively sit back and wait for people to apply? So I recently had a director role um, available, and uh, you know the team was marshaled around. They had a number, and a number of people on my team said, you know, what about this person, what about this person? And not surprising, most were programmers or people who had come up through programming or architecture or whatever. And um, I reached into the talent pool of the organization, not just within tech and ops. And there were two candidates that emerged from there. Uh, one was a uh, very bright, uh, educated female, uh, very capable, had already demonstrated the ability to move around and adapt in her five or six years in the organization. And at the end of the day, um, when, uh, when, when it came right down to it, she brought a business plan to her interview for how she would approach the, uh, the group, taking over this large group. Um, not one of the other candidates applying for, this is a you know, $200,000 a year job, not one of the other people brought a business plan. Guess who got the job? It wasn't because she was a female, wasn't because she was uh, smarter than everybody else, it was because she had thought about the problem. Um, now, she clearly had thought through many, many things and uh, she, it was a result of reaching into a talent pool. She was working in uh, our Canadian banking, commercial banking area. Um, she had previously been known to uh, tech and ops, but um, the way I view it is I'm going to rent this person for probably a year to a year and a half and then hopefully help her into something else. So um, it's a great example of how somebody uh, from a talent pool is picked instead of passively applying. Great. So. Thank you. So as we talked about, you know, advancing uh, women in technology requires all of us to be at the table and participating. Um, and I've seen some great work done this year with Move the Dial with Jody Kovitz and the board list coming to Canada um, and go sponsor her. Uh, however, there's, as I said, there's still a lot of work to do. So I want to ask the panel, um, I'll start with Michelle. Um, what advice have you given to women who are ready for tech leadership roles and who need help finding a sponsor? Uh, so I think that uh, a lot of the women that I know of that are in the technology field actually um, don't consider themselves being qualified for those leadership roles. And so I think that from as a, as a mentor, as a as a colleague, as someone who I, you know, see potential in individuals, um, a lot of that, you know, I take some responsibility myself to actually play that role model and help them, you know, sort of discover other attributes they have that's not based on their ability to code, um, to draw to their attention some of the things like their ability to, you know, pivot on on a problem or to listen to a, a customer insight and translate that into a change in the application they're building because it will make it more usable. So I think when, when I look at helping women um, gain confidence in their leadership skills, absolutely training is a big part of it and gaining access to sponsors, but a little bit of that as well is helping women discover that they have things that go beyond just their technical ability. There is that <coughs> preconception, I think, in a lot of ways that you do have to be the best coder. You have to be the most technical. You have to be the most passionate about the technology to be a technical leader. And I mean, we've talked a little bit already about those attributes don't necessarily need to be technology. They, they could be, um, you know, the ability for them to mentor others, the ability for them to um, help problem solve. And, you know, interesting, through my, my career, I, you know, started in technology as a business analyst, as a QA specialist, and never in my technical career have I actually coded, but I've been able to enable my teams to have those doors opened. Um, you know, I haven't been the most technical in the room, but have I been able to empower my teams to bring ideas that they may not have considered were possibilities because that was what my job was, is to ask the most technical people on my team to come up with the solutions. So I think that um, in doing so, that's given them the opportunity to grow. Um, I've unfortunately been told that I couldn't lead technical teams because I wasn't strong enough technically. Um, 
so therefore I've gone out to, pr to prove differently. Um, <laughs> So you just start your own company. I just start my own company, yeah. no. Um, I have had lots of success. I've also had some very interesting doors closed in my face. Um, but, you know, I think when we talk about sponsorship and mentorship, I mean, it's, it's all of our responsibilities to help, um, help encourage our colleagues, men and women, and, and unlock those attributes that they may not know. And it comes back to feedback and, you know, very caring and um, attentive uh, communications. So if you see someone who is doing something that is special, that is doing something that is unique, that is something that when they're doing it, you see them really shining, let them know that. I mean, in our organizations, we hear of all of the feedback, all of the constructive criticism, but one of the best things we can do to develop our teams is to reinforce those behaviors that we see ourselves as unique and, and possible building blocks towards leadership. Right. So I didn't Thank quite you. answer your question, but sorry. Yeah. Um, I'll put out to, to the whole panel. So um, whoever wants to answer, how can we inspire others? So how can we get, how can we get people engaged? What are those, what those, what do those conversations sound like? I think, I think you, I think you want to just be the example in the sense of you have to walk your talk, be authentic. Um, I, I know that in having challenging conversations that the more authentic you are, the more people relax and are willing to open up. Um, and remember, we're all humans. We've all had our own experiences and we all come to the table with um, our own challenges or insecurities and, and be willing to talk through human to human. And it's led to some very um, fruitful discussions. I have pointed out to, let's say, someone who is a manager of certain things that may be happening. But uh, instead of doing that in a roundtable discussion, as my boss, out of respect, pulled him to the side, had the conversation as the leader, gave him the opportunity to correct what was going on, which happened. So, you know, there's a way to approach things um, in a professional manner. And, um, but the number one thing is be the example. People will watch if they're not, if they're afraid to come up to you or speak to you or say something, they will watch and learn more about you by what you do, how you do it, how you treat other people. And that will give them the courage to maybe do something themselves. I do a lot of mentoring um, young women and one of the things I lead with is um, get out of your comfort zone. Of course, you have to excel at whatever skill you have. In tech, you've got to know how to code. You've got to know, I mean, get ahead of it. So it's a given that you have to be excellent at what you do and keep doing that. But in my view, that's not enough. That's never been enough in my world. And I started out as a psychologist, which is the strangest thing. Um, and then I became a privacy commissioner. It's a, it was not a direct line. But I loved what I did in privacy, which then took me to technology. So then I started learning how to, now actually, as a graduate student, I coded. But we're talking about, I don't know, Pascal. Um, we're talking a long Fortran. time ago. Fortran, <laughs> a long time ago. And that stuff wasn't easy, but it's, n it's not what it is. Anyway, so you have to constantly learn. But the, when I tell people to get out of their comfort zone, especially women, Women have, and I say this with great respect to men, but I think we have better communication skills and we have better social skills. Gen I'm generalizing. Don't worry, I have a great husband. He has all those skills. But <laughs> it's really important to make use of the additional skills that if, if you feel you have them. And it works beautifully. So if you're coding, if you're doing work on whatever data analytics you're doing, whatever you're doing, if you can additionally apply your additional communication skill, for example, and get some discussion about a coding problem that everyone's having and how would you approach it. And it makes such a difference because then you're making yourself known to the boss, to the leadership group. You are standing apart in a very polite, respectful way. But that's, when I think of advances I've had in my careers, it's always been in terms of you gotta have a comfort level also with speaking about yourself and elevating yourself. I don't mean that in a, um, it sounds terrible, but you have to make yourself known mm -hmm. to your bosses, to those in the area, uh, very respectfully, and seek out what else you can do. What additional tasks can you do? Are there some particular coding challenges that haven't been addressed? I do a lot of work now with artificial intelligence. 
um, you know, machine learning, deep learning, neural networks. It's an amazing area. But surprisingly, what the, the big issue that is now grasping people is the inherent lack of transparency and accountability in the AI algorithms that are being developed and the potential for bias, discrimination. The, so I, I've been pondering this. So I just developed something called um, AI ethics by design, set of seven principles on how you can embed accountability, respectability, re uh, responsibility, things of that nature into the code and find it out early so that you can find out what AI operations can stand on its own versus someone else. So I was talking to a female engineer about this and she said, never occurred to me to apply that to engineering. And I said, but that's in our world, all of these various areas are intertwining and those of us who can identify those and then bring it forward, I think will we'll really stand out. Is anybody else worried now about artificial intelligence? And <laughs> <laughs> you're scaring me. Let me um, tell you how. Yeah. No, and, but let me give you a comment. I am a big fan of artificial intelligence. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. we will learn things and have discoveries that we, we couldn't even have contemplated. So please don't get me wrong. It's again the positive sum mindset: AI and privacy, AI and responsible treatment of of the data, so that you don't have inherent biases in, in it. Yeah. Bring your thoughts back just for a second to the role of the leader and, and away from the employee. Because I think if the employee is pushing upstream all the time, they're never going to get there without being sponsored, pulled, whatever. Um, but think about the biggest problem you've ever faced in your career. And some of us who've had long careers have been in some, what you would typically look back on now and say those are famous you know, outages, whatever. And think about the, tab the people that were around the table eating pizza with you for three or four or five days or whatever it was as you worked your way through it. And think about the composition of that team. In my experience, it generally wasn't five middle-aged white guys. It was everything from you know, co-op students to the most senior technical guru and every um, possibility of, of age and uh, ethnicity and gender on the best ones. Uh, we had one a year and a half ago, nobody even knows about, uh, thank God. And uh, <laughs> we managed the, the, the corporate comms person was sitting there with us for the entire three or four days, and we managed to keep it out of the Global Mail, um, which is, you know, frankly, one of our objectives all the time. Um, but the reality is the team that made that happen and the team that recovered that system was a very diverse, broad, general team, including my boss, Bruce, all the way down to an analyst. Um, so, you know, think about those types of problem solving situations and you won't get there with five middle-aged white guys around the table anymore. So I would just leave you with that thought. All right, I can see there's some people in the back looking at their watches so we're over time. But I do have a challenge for all of you that came today. So um, when we look out at the speakers that are at the conference, we could use some diversity there. So um, if you are sponsoring or mentoring women, that part of their development plan is being a speaker at a conference. So I know I gave an example. So there's um, a woman that I work with who does technology engagement. There was an API conference in Berlin. She looked at the conference pages. It was a lot of guys. She emailed them and she said, hey, what, you know, what's going on here? Um, you know, like I could, I could present. And they said, great. Within two minutes, her picture was up on the website for that conference because they were looking for people. So I, yeah. I thought, wow, there are huge opportunities. So, you know, we want to see more diversity in our speakers. We have amazing women in our organizations. So when you're sponsoring and mentoring them, challenge them, you know, be a speaker. Start with a small panel, whether, you know, if you're in a large organization, you know, places like RBC, we have opportunities to have panels all the time. Start them out there. Tap into, you know, your communications groups to get some training on speaking. But really, um, we know that so many conferences would, would like to see that kind of diversity. I had some conversations with the chair here around that too. So I would challenge you, the next conference that you're going to, um, think about the people that you're working with. Think about the people that are looking for those opportunities and get them out as speakers. And I think that'll make a, a huge uh, difference. So I want to thank all of our panelists for joining me today. Thank you so much for your insights. Um, I hope for all of you it was valuable and I think I'm standing between you and lunch. So um, thanks very much.